Almost most people are back and hope that the sound of the discussion will ring the rest. Uh, couldn't give me more pleasure to do this, to introduce Herman Fesch back than anything else. Uh, Herman's been my teacher, let's say, since 1950 and my collaborator since 1960. Uh, as I was saying earlier, uh, he and Vicky were the reason that we started this Center for Theoretical Physics and the inspiration for it, and uh, he was the first director of it. And, uh, we all know who he is, so I'm not going to say any more, Herman. <laughs> Are we on? Yep. Thank you, Arthur. I can't help, uh, I can't resist, uh, but uh, make the following remark at the end of the talks this, uh, this afternoon. Uh, as you all know, economists have proven that it's difficult to predict the future. And we all also now know that historians and field theorists find it difficult to predict the past. When, uh, in the good old early days, before the war, there was no theoretical nuclear physics at MIT. There were a number of experimentalists, Rob Lee Evans has been mentioned, uh, Van de Graaff, uh, Bill Buckner, and Stan Livingston, who built uh, the uh, cyclotron that was mentioned earlier today. But there was the ostensible or the, uh, well, the nuclear theorist was presumably Phil Morse, but he had given up nuclear physics. He had done a number of papers with uh, Fisk, Jim Fisk, and Leonard Schiff, uh, but then got interested in acoustics. So for me, the arrival of Vice Cup Zacharias and Rossi was an absolutely great event, the greatest event in my career, of course. Uh, Vicky came with, uh, with uh, a couple uh, postdocs, uh, Wayne Bowers and, uh, and um, uh, Ted Welton. And uh, we got uh, a great deal of excitement and interest in those days. Uh, Vicky, of course, was at the forefront of the field. And so, for the first time, as it were, I was at the forefront of the field. But beyond that, uh, there was Vicky's, uh, Vicky as a role model. I um, <clears throat> wrote this 20 years ago almost now when Vicky retired. Let me just quote it again. His was an unquenchable desire to understand the essential physical elements involved in a phenomenon to strip away the complexities of a detailed explanation and to make visible the underlying ideas and concepts. It's an attitude which we at MIT particularly have come to appreciate and emulate. Uh, let me also, while I'm still reminiscing, uh, we were told today about the halcyon days right after <clears throat> uh, World War II, where uh, nuclear physicists were, uh, how shall I say it, uh, uh, extremely popular. And I have two stories in that regard. One is the Shelter Island story that Vicky told you, but let me tell you at the beginning of it. Uh, Vicky and I and Julian Schwinger rode down on the train from Boston to New York, discussing, of course, the uh, new data from Columbia. And we um, then went up to then the headquarters of the American Physical Society, or I think. Maybe it's the American Institute of Physics, I can't quite recall. But anyway, we waited around, and then a rickety old bus arrived. We got on it, we crossed the bridge into Queens, and from Queens into Long Island, at which point we were met by a pair of motorcycle policemen, and the bus drove all the way to Greenpoint, or Green, Greenpoint, Greenport, at the end of the island, the whole 120 miles or so, escorted by uh, motorcycle police. 
So we were, as I should say, very highly regarded. At, at Greenpoint, we were given a big, luscious dinner. Now, the other story is a few years later, uh, Bernie Feld had put me down as a possible consultant to a company called Nuclear Development Associates. And uh, the AEC decided, and Vicky was also there, decided to uh, do a security study of us. So one day I was told to come down. Uh, it was actually rather inconvenient, but I, I, of course, agreed to New York, to Columbus Circle, where I was um, to be, uh, uh, where, where, where I was to be asked questions. Uh, I had difficulty getting down. I had started out good and early, uh, but the DC-4s that American Airlines was, were flying in those days failed, uh, two of them in a row. So I arrived just in time to come into this meeting. Now here I am just, uh, let's see, was I an associate professor at the time? I think I was. Uh, but after all, uh, 32 years old or something. And the room was filled with uh, uh, people I didn't know, of course. I was all alone. Uh, and the chief of the um, security uh, system for the AEC was there. Admiral Cochran had come up from Washington just for this purpose. And I was asked, uh, you know, whether I, they would I would mind if they would make a transcript of what I said. And I had been forewarned by Vicky and. And so I said, no, I wouldn't mind if they took it down, but I'd want a copy. And then the first question came, and it's, the man asked me, uh, you uh, are a member of the executive committee of the Cambridge Association of Scientists. Now, that was a forerunner of the, the FAS. I said, yes, I was. Question, uh, do you, have you seen any communist infiltration in that board? Uh, I, the transcript says, flashback laughter. Uh, and after a while, I found out what was going on. Namely, Wendell Furry was on, uh, on that board. And this dangerous communist would be endangering, of course, our security. Uh, but that gives you, I think, two sides of our popularity. Now, what I'm going to do is narrow my discussion to the discussion of reactions. It's an interesting story in a way, because although there are very random influences, the result uh, is uh, quite coherent. And so I'd like to make sure we get those, those uh, 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 random uh, things that did happen. Now, Vicky came in with, of course, uh, the, the reputation of being the expert on nuclear reactions. He had invented the uh, evaporation model in 37, and then there was a, uh, a, a very seminal paper with uh, Ewing uh, in, I guess, 39, and this is used to this day in that domain in which evaporation theory is valid. We added a little bit onto it later when we uh, uh, discussed or added to it the conditions of uh, <clears throat> uh, conservation of parity and angular momentum. So after the, uh, when he arrived, we got to working once more on reactions. And of course, the big thing was resonances. And so with Peasley, we worked a paper on the boundary condition model which had the uh, great merit of being simple and easy to understand. And in fact, at the same time, uh, Wigner uh, worked on a, a similar model, but of course made it much more elaborate by making it multi-channel, whereas we were single channel. But the big breakthrough came with uh, Boschel's data on the total cross-sections for nuclei uh, interacting with uh, MEV neutrons. I'll show you that curve shortly. And uh, uh, I remember uh, sitting with Hans Bethe at a breakfast somewhere for some meeting, and we were discussing the data, and we both were puzzled 
as to how that could come out of, of, out of all the resonances we knew that existed in, in the, the, that neutron nucleus interaction. Well, what developed, of course, was the uh, paper with Porter and Weisskopf on the, um, what we call the cloudy crystal ball model. It's now called the optical model, which I, I really dislike as a term because it really is referring to things which are valid at a much higher energy. This is a low energy story. And uh, uh, Dave Saxon of co also uh, worked on at that time, and there's a Wood Saxon potential which everybody knows about. Uh, what we got, of course, was a very good um, Now, where is that gadget? Oh, there it is. A very good match with the data. This is actually the theory. Uh, this axis is the uh, energy, really. There's the total cross-section in units of the uh, area of the sphere, and here is the uh, radius. And you see that this represents a very smooth, slowly energy dependent, except you know you get a 1 over v law at the beginning here, but once you get beyond that, it's just a threshold effect. These things vary rather slowly with energy and actually also with radius, which is the same as saying with mass number. Uh, but that's not the important thing. We first uh, did this with, uh, uh, well, let me just say that's not the important thing. What the important thing was is in the appendix to that paper, where Vicky showed that you could get an understanding of these phenomena by energy averaging the resonances. In other words, you could start off with a resonance formulation of the cross sections, and then by energy averaging, you would develop the optical model. And this is a, a concept which is of great importance and which uh, we uh, will refer to over and over again. Uh, later on, he developed it further with Francis Friedman in an article in a Bohr uh, festival book, and showed that the energy averaging had the following effect. It separated uh, the prompt part of the reaction from the delayed part of the reaction. It did not include the delayed part of the reaction, which would be due to, let's say, particles getting caught in the nucleus and remaining there because they're in a resonant state, for example. Uh, so the prompt part was described by the optical potential, and, that, uh, and uh, uh, that's a, a phenomenon we want to uh, we'll refer to over and over again, an idea we refer to over and over again. Uh, this, uh, at the same time, there were other uh, prompt processes going on, uh, namely the so-called direct process like uh, deuterons in, protons out, uh, inelastic scattering, and so on. And uh, for example, that was, I think, Dave Peasley's uh, thesis. Uh, and uh, uh, so there was a dilemma which was set up, if you wish, or a paradox or a problem. I should say, perhaps call it a problem, in which one would try to develop a formalism which at the same time explained the direct reactions prompt reactions, if you wish, explain the resonances, and by energy averaging gave you the optical model. Now, uh, this is a problem which I didn't attack frontally. What happened was that Vicky one day said to me, you know, there ought to be a relation like the chronic Cromer's relation in optics. You remember that's a relation between the real and imaginary part of the index of refraction, there ought to be such a relation for nuclear physics, for the 
passage, let's say, of a neutron through nuclear matter. And uh, that, in fact, led to a, a theory or a formalism which did all the things I just asked for and more. I must tell you that I got the idea for how to handle that situation sitting in an airplane behind Bigna. So you see, uh, we, uh, I had great influences working on me. Uh, not only were we able to explain the three things I just mentioned, namely the, uh, the uh, um, direct reactions, the optical model, and uh, the uh, performance of the appropriate energy averaging, which, by the way, Michel Baranger made a very helpful remark. Uh, but we also were able to include the Pauli principle. The Pauli principle is, uh, is, of course, has to be there when you have an incident particle, which is a nucleon, or composed of nucleons, incident on a nucleus. Later, we developed this, uh, these particular papers were for protons and neutrons, incident on nuclei. Later, we developed, uh, the, extended the formulism, if you wish, for particle transfer reactions in which, let's say, you have a proton coming in or a deuteron coming out or a heavy ion coming in and another heavy ion coming out. So those all can be handled and the Pauli principle included. But to return to the main theme, that prompt and delayed. Now, what are the orders of magnitude of these things? Well, if you take a look at a, a neutron resonance, a resonance of a few volts, electron volts, the lifetime is of the order of 10 to the minus 22 seconds. I'm sorry, 10 to the minus 15 seconds. On the other hand, the structure that you saw in, the, in that uh, C in this thing is of the order of a few MeV or more. And that gives you a lifetime of the uh, a, 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 a time constant, if you wish, of the order of 10 to the minus 22, 10 to the minus 23 seconds. So you have an enormous range between 10 to the minus 15th and 10 to the minus 23. And the question is, isn't there something in between? So of course, again, instead of asking the question directly or trying to answer it directly, we looked at some phenomena. You know, without experimentalists, we'd be all dead. And uh, the phenomenon we looked at, I looked at with Barry Block, uh, was the pheno was uh, uh, shown here. It's uh, this is the so-called strength function, which is an average of the of the width of uh, of the let's say of uh, resonances divided by the energy dis dif distance between them, average as a function of atomic weight. And this solid line was the uh, cloudy crystal ball model uh, prediction. Now, don't worry about this stuff here. That got understood in the terms of the fact that these nuclei were deformed. What interest, interested us was these very low values here, which uh, uh, were, you know, very far away from the prediction. And the predictions were very good in here, but again, there was a bunch here where one might be concerned. But we really worried about this uh, arena there. And the explanation turned out to be that if you send a neutron in, let's say, hits a nucleus, it'll hit a nu nucleon a nucleus, it'll get, ex it'll get de excited, and nucleon a nucleus will get excited. And on that basis, it created a two-particle, one-hole state. Two particles excited, one hole where the, one of the particles was. Now, uh, we thought of this as a doorway state in the sense that in order to get to the very complicated compound nuclear uh, wave functions, one had to pass through that state in order to develop the complexity. And uh, so that was. So this, this phenomenon here, again, I suddenly lost it. This phenomenon here of these low values was an indication of the density of, of, um, of two particle, one whole states was low. And Barry Block actually calculated that on a, a model. And these uh, points, which are empty, 
are his theoretical values. And here are the experimental values of filled points. So that was the introduction of doorway states, or in French, etat du poids. And uh, the thing that naturally came up now was, well, this was an average. So it's an average over perhaps many doorway states. Are there doorway states which are isolated, that stand out by themselves? And actually, there were at the time three different varieties. There was the giant electric dipole resonance, there was the isobar analog resonance, there was the um, isomeric fission uh, structure. And so there came a, a question, how do you develop, uh, carry this theory uh, further uh, so that one can describe not only the averages but also the isolated uh, doorway state resonance, of which I gave you some examples. And this was worked out in a paper with Kerman and uh, Dick Lemmer. And uh, uh, I, I needn't uh, elaborate a little uh, too much on it, except for the following. I'd like to show you this very nice curve. If you look at this up here, is molybdenum PP, notice the scale, this is 5.2 to 5.4. It's a high resolution experiment, uh, and you get these uh, characteristic fluctuations uh, which occur uh, in nuclear reactions, if, which you can see if you make a good uh, resolution experiment. If you wish, it's a sort of a noise spectrum. Now, if you take a poorer resolution experiment, do, don't do as good a job. In other words, do an average over this whole thing. Look what comes out. That's the bottom curve. Beautiful, beautiful scattering resonance, proving that our fundamental ideas on this matter were correct. Now, the next step, well, I'll leave this up here. The next step, uh, might, you might think, is obvious. Namely, again, let us uh, 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 see if we can't get structure which is now in between the doorway state structure, the giant resonance structure, and the compound nucleus structure. But again, that's not the way it happened. I uh, went to a meeting in Plavice Lakes, run by Nicolas Sindro. That's a very beautiful part of what is now Croatia and I hope it's still there. Uh, it's an area with, you know, a dozen lakes, several waterfalls of varying heights and so forth, a great place. And I, my job was to summarize this conference, which was on, among other things, what was known as pre-equilibrium reactions. I won't try to define that here now. And my summary said essentially, hey, this is great stuff, but it ain't quantum mechanics. Uh, and uh, thereby presented myself with a challenge to, to produce the quantum mechanics. Well, that uh, year, that spring, that was in the summer, so the next spring, I had to give an invited talk somewhere, and I had to, I had to invent the theory, which I did, which is now called uh, statistical multi-step compound uh, reactions. And when I got back to Cambridge, I found out that Steve Coonan and Arthur Kerman had invented the same theory. Uh, so, of course, we got together and developed uh, results. Uh, you have to show that there was a reason for doing this uh, beside the, my adventure in Plavice. And let me present such a reason so you'll see what was going on. Uh, where are we? I keep losing this thing. What we have here is a, uh, a 51 vanadium PN reaction to chromium. The energy of the proton is 22 MeV. The angle is 144 degrees. This is an experiment done at Livermore by Grimes and uh, Anderson and others. And these dark, these boxes here, the dark points are experiment. And this is the prediction of the Weisskopf 
Ewing theory, these boxes here. So you see by the time the, uh, the, uh, this is the excitation energy of the residual nucleus, so this is low energy neutrons, high energy neutrons. So as we got to high energy neutrons, the statistical theory failed miserably to give the experimental results by orders of magnitude. So that's, of course, a, st a stimulant to look at it, and it was explained by um, Grimes et al. as a, uh, again, an, the, uh, uh, as a uh, result of the presence of doorway states and the reactions in which doorway states were uh, uh, involved. In other words, it, um, there were many doorway states and you averaged over them and that way you got the, uh, got the result, uh, which I'll come back to. Well, uh, that looked very good and in fact I presented it for uh, Steve and Arthur and myself at the Munich Conference on International Conference on Nuclear Physics. And we got a very heated letter from Laura uh, Coley Malazzo, a very great uh, Italian uh, nuclear physicist. She said, you can't be right. Well, why can't we be right? Well, you predict that the cross sections, the angular distributions are symmetric around 90 degrees, and I can show you reaction after reaction where they're peaked in the forward direction. Uh, well, that summer, I uh, met with Arthur Kerman at Los Alamos, and we discussed uh, Laura's uh, problems, and we came off with a solution, and I worked the rest of it out on the plane going home, and that became the statistical multi-step direct reaction. And uh, let me spend a few minutes telling you about that because uh, it's the answer to all reaction problems, if you wish. If you take a typical, I'm sorry, take a typical spectrum, uh, let's say a PN reaction, if you wish. This is the energy of the neutron. This is the uh, double differential cross section. This is the spectrum. In this general arena area, low energy neutrons, you find Vicky's evaporation, spherical angular distribution, very rapid energy dependence, lots and lots and lots of fluctuations, which came known as the Erickson fluctuations. On this end, with the high energy neutrons, in other words, not much energy loss to the nucleus, uh, you have the direct reactions, which have a, will pick up particular levels. And those are, have a very slow energy dependence, as I pointed out, and they're very strongly forward peaked. So we have the whole business to explain between here and here. Now, what was pretty obvious from the beginning is that <clears throat> interaction time is short here and long there. So inter this whole energy axis maps roughly onto interaction time. But how do you make the interaction time long? You make it long by developing complicated states. That takes time to do. So not only does energy map into interaction time, it maps as well into complexity. And uh, let me give a diagrammatic uh, picture of that. How do we get the complexity? Well, we start out in an initial state. And we develop, I'll just look at one of these, uh, a, a daisy chain in which these states are more and more uh, complicated. And I'll give you an example uh, of that so that you know what I'm talking about. Suppose, for example, uh, we have an incident nucleon. It interacts and falls into the well with the other nucleons, exciting this one, of course. Here you see you have the two particle, one whole state. So this is the, the doorway state. And then you go on with further interactions, and you'll get three particle, this is wrong, 
three particle two hole states, <laughs> isn't that lovely? And uh, so on. Uh, so you get more and more complexity. Uh, more and more, the wave function, of course, consists of this plus that plus that, amplitudes from each of these. So as you get on to further and further excitations, you get more and more co complex. Now, the other case, the P space, uh, you start out again uh, up here, and you excite one of these nucleons up. This drops down, but doesn't get captured. So this, if you wish, is a free particle plus a one particle, one hole state. And uh, that's an example of the complexity. Now, the theory here is developed on a very, uh, on basis of two approximations. Uh, one is the so-called chaining hypothesis, which I'll illustrate back here. The chaining hypothesis is essentially a way for saying that this process is Markovian, namely uh, that uh, you don't, uh, the interaction doesn't take you from this state of complexity to that state of complexity. You have to go through all the intermediate stages. In other words, you can forming the interaction on a wave function in this particular box will take you either this way, this way, or it'll stay there, but it won't skip any of the boxes. So uh, that's one hypothesis. The other hypothesis is the random phase, which I'll bring up here because it's Uh, the random phase says that the various amplitudes we're going to consider, uh, uh, when averaged, uh, will simply be a sum, as indicated, of the diagonal values. There'll be no uh, uh, u nu u lambda stuff. Now, this is important because I haven't said what nu is. If nu Nu, of course, are the quantum numbers, and in the case of Q space, remember where everything is bound, the quantum numbers are simply J and pi, that is the angular momentum and the parity. And if you make the average, and there's no interference between various values of J or parity, you get, of course, an angular distribution which is symmetric about 90. And that's what Coley Malazzo complained about. It is symmetric about 90 if you're dealing with statistical multi-step compound uh, reactions. On the other hand, for the p-space, where at least one particle is in the continuum, you see that not only do you have the j and the pi of the uh, residual nucleus, but you also have another quantum number, namely this angular, <coughs> this linear momentum. And so the whole averaging issue changes, and uh, you therefore get a difference between the multi-step compound and the multi-step direct. Well, I'm obviously not going to work all of this out for you uh, in detail, but let me just show you some of the results. You remember we, I showed you this curve here. Now, if you include the multi-step multi compound and add that on to this curve, you get these x's. That's uh, done with one parameter. I'll come back to the parameters later. And uh, Steve Coonan worked this out, as well as the next one, which illustrates the uh, method. Uh, this, I believe, is tantalum. It's at a large angle, uh, so that uh, it's a uh, multi-step compound. And here is the experimental curve. Uh, and here is what you get just from evaporation. Again, you see this huge difference. This is what you get when you add in the multi-step compound. The sum is here. At this end, you've got to add in two neutrons and three neutrons, which you simply do from evaporation theory, and you get the final answer. 
there. Now, in the multi-step direct domain, uh, a lot of uh, many, many uh, reactions have been studied by uh, Coley Malazzo, Bonetti, and uh, Peter. Peter, Peter, what's your name? I'll remember it later. Uh, and uh, they, um, uh, I have to hand it to Laura Coley and Bonetti because they got a hold of a, a preprint of ours which had an infinite number of mistakes in it, typos of various kinds. And they were able to decipher it and actually go to work. And this is their result. Hodgson, Peter Hodgson. So uh, what we have here, again, is U, that's the excitation energy. This is the neutron energy spectrum. This is 30 degrees. Energy is 45 MeV. And you can see this is the result if we have only one step. So this is a wish you wish, the direct, usual direct calculation. And as you see, it'll fail at low energies. You add in two steps, three steps. These don't. Uh, so far down, they don't matter. And uh, your final result is this curve. And it matches pretty well with the data, not in this region, because uh, they didn't add in the two and three neutron evaporation things. So bear it in mind that in this case, one single collision did very well, f at least for the uh, uh, high energy neutrons. Now, if you go to 90 degrees, uh, here is again the result, and you can see that a single, single uh, step uh, just fails very quickly. And you've got to add in two and three steps before you can get this curve here. And now, if you go to four steps, I'm sorry, if you go to another angle, <coughs> oops. so now 120 degrees. And now you see one step uh, really is only a value at the very highest energy. Two steps and three steps are needed in order to get this curve. These are semi-log plots, so these deviations are substantial, but the general tenor and, uh, and uh, behavior of the, of the cross sections are well represented. Uh, let me do one more of these. This is now the angular distribution up to the time that this theory was developed, really. Uh, people de depended upon the direct reaction theory, and so they uh, didn't do anything about the big angles, which, as you can see, uh, this is the uh, excitation energy of the nucleus, and you can see for both high and low energy, it does quite well. That's rather old actually, but there have been a great many experiments done since then with that kind of treatment. And I'll give you the last one I saw, which is now at 150 MeV. Remember, the other data was at 45, and we've also done it at uh, lower energies. Uh, well, the one with uh, Grimes and all was at 20. Uh, so here we have nickel, 150 MeV, and these are the various uh, energies of the emerging protons. And I'll just point out that here are the experimental points, and the fit is here. Not so hotsy totsy here. But after all, if a theory is any worth anything, it, it has to be wrong sometimes. It's, if it can't be wrong, it can't be right. Now, uh, here is the single scattering, uh, so one step, two steps, three steps, four steps, five steps. And of course, as you can see, as you increase the number of steps, you have you know, the, 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 the gut feeling that this is doing the right thing, because the hot, in order to get to big angles, you should need more steps. And there's another one of these <coughs> curves. Uh, the authors are down here. They're a group from South Africa. And here's Hodgson and Bonetti, who did, of course, the work on analyzing. Now, this is 
a different 100, 120, 150, and you can see the nature of the fits at each of these energies. Now, if you're interested in phenomenology and that sort of thing, you say, well, how many, how many, uh, how many uh, parameters did you use to fit that data? The answer is that a given energy, only one parameter, and independent of the nucleus and uh, independent of whether it was a, a statistical multi-step compound or a statistical multi-step direct. And here are the parameters. This is the coupling potential, V naught, right here, which gives you the probability, if you wish, the magnitude of the probability of going from one complexity to the next complexity. And uh, it falls along a curve like this. It's a totally reasonable curve. It's the same curve, uh, essentially parallel to the behavior of the central part of the optical potential as a function of energy. So I'll finish up with just two other examples. As you remember, Vicky said, is there a kramers koenig relation for uh, nuclear? interactions? The answer is yes, and in that early paper, 58, 1958, that uh, relationship was developed. Uh, recently, uh, Claude Maho has looked at this in some detail, and I want to show you uh, his result. Remember, you relate the real to the imaginary part. The imaginary part, the optical potential, essentially you get out of looking at reaction rates and so usually you have pretty good information about those. And then you stick that into the relationship and predict the real part. So he tested it out. And here it is, the alpha, by the way, not just for this case, but never mind. Now this is not quite the potential. It's the integral of the potential over space. V represents the real part, W the imaginary part. And as you expect, the imaginary part has a, a threshold and then it's fairly constant. Uh, actually, eventually, it grows logarithmically. But over this domain, this is a representation. So he approximated this by a uh, functional straight line plus a constant. Then you can do the dispersion integrals. And this is the prediction. Uh, for the uh, solid line, the solid line. For the broken line, the broken line. And these points here are experimental points. So you see, yes, there is a Karma's chronic relation, Professor Weisskopf, for this kind of um, store, um, for, for nuclear matter. Now, uh, I didn't tell you what the answers were like for the uh, multi-step compound, multi-step direct. They really quite look good when you see them at the end. They, they feel right. And for the multi-step direct, what it consisted of is a series of foldings. You take a scattering, the first step, and you, um, so you, make, you, you get to the first stage of complexity. Let's say that with a moment, started out with an initial momentum k sub i, you go to k sub 1. Then you take another step. That means you go from states with k sub 1 to states with k sub 2. You do that by folding. Then we go from K2 to K3 and so forth until you come to N steps. And at the end, you want to have the final momentum. So that means you've achieved uh, those, uh, the final momentum in N steps. And then you sum over N. Now, uh, there is a phenomenon in heavy ions uh, called deep inelastic scattering, in which the two heavy ions uh, have a nice conversation with each other, but they don't get into bed with each other. Uh, they don't form compound nuclei. Uh, they exchange particles, uh, verbs, nouns, adjectives, and so on. Uh, but they and hang around for quite a long time, but they don't, as I say, form a compound nucleus. Now, this is just set up for multi-step direct reactions. And uh, we looked at that with Bent Lauritsen. Uh, and in the limit in which the change in momenta and the change in angular momenta 
are uh, between steps is small. That is, going from step one, two, three, and four, each step involves a small change. If you do that, then you derive from our general expressions uh, a uh, fokker planck equation in momentum and angular momentum space. And then by ingenious strategies, uh, uh, you can integrate that equation. That's a lie, by the way. It's uh, an approximation that's used. It has the advantage that it uh, is quick and dirty uh, and uh, gives you an answer. And you can do it in, in a relatively short time. And this is the kind of result you get. This reproduction didn't come out too well. It's uh, this cross section. Uh, U again is the excitation energy. Theta is the angle. So it's d theta. Notice not sine theta, d theta. It's 40 argon 40 and thorium 232, and the energy is 388 MeV. And uh, these, this is the experimental situation. These are three fits. And this is the one we like the best. You can see this part of the structure is well developed. This part of the structure is also well developed. The thing we miss is this piece in here. And so of course, that's experimental error. Uh, but the, as you can see, the theory does a nice job in uh, at least qualitatively looking at this. Thing. I'm going to stop here. I can go on indefinite period. I haven't mentioned a lot of reaction work that was done at MIT. There is the infamous, a famous Kerman, McManus, and Thaler description of multiple scattering, which is the basis of the understanding of, let's say, 1 GeV protons on nuclei. There's um, the time-dependent Hartree-Fock, which maybe Steve will talk about. There is the uh, uh, boundary condition model that uh, that uh, Earl Lohman has used in discussing pi nucleon scattering. And there's a doorway state formalism that uh, Moniz, uh, um, Lenz, Moniz, and Yazaka used in discussing pi nucleus scattering. They had a rather ingenious generalization, which I wish I had time to discuss with you. Uh, most of this work was done while I was uh, administrating like mad. Uh, which I did for about 20 odd years. And the only reason it got done is because I had superb students, did all the work, and I had the collaboration with my friends, Vicky Weisskopf and Arthur Kerman. And I want to take this opportunity to thank them uh, publicly, uh, acknowledge my debt to them publicly. And I also want to thank the Laboratory for Nuclear Science which made it possible to work that hard. Thank you.